a lot of people are afraid of Friday the 13th. But for me, it uh, holds a special place in my heart. Friday the 13th, uh, September 2002. There's a place called Kengeles, ABC. For the youth, it's now Mercury. That used to be Kengeles. And uh, I was working then for Microsoft, and we had uh, an executive, cool guy, who had uh, visited us for the week. And we decided we are taking him out on Friday night. And uh, we ended up, uh, Kengeles, what was happening. Uh, sitting on the balcony, uh, having drinks, I see a couple of friends of mine, uh, uh, a guy and a, a, a girl, who are accompanied by the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. I kid you not. And uh, anyway, this story starts half a century before that. My name is Andrew. Uh, I was born Andrew Waititungunya in Kisumu to a Kikuyu engineer and a nurse of uh, Luya and Maasai extraction. So you can see I'm fully Kenyan. What I didn't understand at the time that my father, who was, uh, I guess, a typical dictator of the time, was, uh, you know, a pretty interesting guy. We never, I never had a relationship with him, uh, you know, none whatsoever. And... Uh, as we grew up, we make fun of it now with my siblings, but you know, when, when dad would come home, when you hear his car, you hear the front door opening, everybody would dash. You hear doors slamming, boom, 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 in the house. You, know, you don't want to be found out and about because they'll be, they'll be held to pay. And uh, it's only as I grew up and started you know, interacting with, with friends and, and all that. By the way, we are not even allowed friends at home. He started realizing this actually isn't the norm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I kind of picked up from there is that as I grow up, one of the things I would like to change is the kind of father that I would be. Growing up, uh, we were literally brought up by, by my mom. And uh, I would say my dad had a, a board role, advisory, once a month, AGM <laughs> kind of thing, you know, from far. Uh, but here we are. So talk about contrast. I'm the chick at Kengele is the hot one, you know. As my friends say, a good friend of mine says that at that time we were the latest. But we're not the greatest now. But at that time we were the latest. So when we got to Kengele's, I wondered how this dude knew everyone except me. I must have been missing out. But I must say, my guy here, he was special. He chased hard. He was the only invitee to my sister's baby shower and had the most exquisite gift. So, moving into this interesting dynamic that we have, he came to the baby shower, he's won, he's God, I'm his. We get married. This is where the contrast start. You know, kisses were many. We planned to have 400 people at our wedding. Turned out we had 700 people at our wedding. Us guys were 75. <laughs> <laughs> so my first three, four years in, in Microsoft uh, were head years. I mean, uh, I was my, my trajectory career-wise, I think I changed three roles in like four years. Uh, you know, everything is just looking hunky-dory. You're, you're on this, you know, stratosphere of, you know, the, the sky's the limit. And then in, uh, I think it was 2005 in September, all that came crashing down. As these organizations usually do, they, there's a reorg, you know, it's announced, we are changing things, our focus, blah, blah, blah. You know, we are looking at Africa differently. And so these roles are disappearing, and then we have these roles. Not the difference. These roles are disappearing, and we have these. Mine was one of these ones, disappearing. And you'll get a letter, tells you, okay, your job has ended, you have two months, you can apply for these roles, and uh, see where that goes. Uh, obviously, at this type, point in time, just gotten married, uh, hoping to start a family, uh, have kids, and the usual bra de bra but you're scared. This, this has hit you, you know, straight in the face, 
you've gotten used to a certain lifestyle, you're already you know, thinking, oh, I'm going to move from this apartment to we're going to get a bigger major net in Kilimani and blah, blah, blah. You can see where your life is going. This happens. And luckily at the time, I had a good mentor within the company. And this guy basically told me, you know, just calm down. You've been doing well. People recognize what you're doing. You apply for the roles that you want and we'll guide you through this. And uh, this took about two months. So it was coinciding very closely with the end of your actual job. So you don't know whether you've got a new job, but you know your old one is disappearing. So you can imagine that angst. And uh, luckily I got a job but the job just happened to be in South Africa. And so we start talking about a move to South Africa uh, with Esther. And here I think I would say, you know, I'm just, you know, blind with the happiness that I have a job. I'm not thinking that much about how she's going to deal with it. She's also working. Uh, and we say, okay, you know, you, I mean, let's look for something uh, that can happen for you and we'll, we'll make this work. In February the uh, next year, she, you know, announces, oh, by the way, we're expecting. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Now, we are supposed to be moving. We have kids coming. Uh, we didn't know there were kids. There was, we thought it was one. <clears throat> but uh, uh, what then happens is that now we have to think of, think this thing through. So we decide Esther is going to stay back. Uh, she'll stay here for six months. Better, uh, you know, support structure, all that kind of stuff. The kids, when they're about six months old, and Esther can move to SA. So, cut a long story short, Esther is having, literally, in my view, I guess as a man, a wonderful pregnancy. She's active, she's working, she's everywhere, we are playing golf and, and stuff. She's, I mean, everything is going well for her, according to her as well. But around month eight, uh, I'm back in, I'm now in SA. Uh, I get a call from her brother, they have rushed her to hospital. And uh, she's uh, having a bit of trouble breathing, but it seems that there's, there's, a, there's a different problem, so they're doing tests and all that. Anyway, turns out what we thought was just the usual kind of leg swelling because you're pregnant, blah, 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 was deep vein thrombosis, so she has a clot in her leg. And so they get her onto uh, a medicine, blood thinning medicine, and in the course of this, so we are thinking she'll be there for maybe three, four days. Uh, once that is managed, she'll be back home, you know, sit out the rest of the pregnancy at home. She'll be told not to move and all that. But within the space of a couple of hours, something shifted. And I don't mean that in, in, the, in the sense of this. But she started build, a buildup of uh, fluid in her lungs. And so from seeing a very relaxed, you know, woman in her bed, yes, but she's laughing and all that, to all of a sudden having a discussion with doctors telling you, okay, this is what we are going to do. We are going to have to put her under, we'll prepare the babies for a C-section, get them out, and then we see if we can save her. Challenge here is that because obviously she's got the blood clot, uh, number two, she's on this blood thinning medicine, so once they do the operation, she can easily bleed to death. And I'm here thinking, where did I sign up for this? I mean, my life was hunky-dory in, in Joburg. You know, I was living almost a semi-bachelor life there. And now here I am wondering if this woman is going to, you know, <laughs> leave me alone on the planet, love of my life, and maybe with children on top of that. It was a tough time. But one of the key things that I remember about that time was a couple of mates of mine who came and spent time with me. Just by being around, you know, I would say in, in those moments of huge change, you need some anchor points. And these anchor points are my, re, my brothers. They are, some of them, are, a couple of them are in this room, I know today. Uh, but with this kind of major change, uh, you need this, these kind of people. So, I'll let Esther take it up from there. I'm alive. <laughs> I'm truly grateful for being alive. I spent two months in hospital, and since we had twins, I couldn't really tell who was Sarah, who was Kanye. They were named, I never saw them. I saw them when they were much older. So the excitement for me to leave hospital alive, although on medication, was a feeling of such joy that I've been given another chance. 
Then we get home and my imagination of this new chance at life was a perfect life. The babies are going to cry, we're going to wake up and we're going to feed them together. We're going to change diapers. That was the joy I left the hospital with, reality. You can't wake up sometimes. Sometimes you're going to do it alone. Sometimes you have no idea what you're supposed to do. That was the reality. My lovely husband here would sometimes say, let's go out for dinner. I couldn't understand. I'm like, dinner? Children? Like, boss, where are your priorities? We've got children to take care of. Then he says, okay, we can't go. That's fine. We'll do it the next time. And then, um, uh, anyway, in the meantime, I'm going to have a beer. I'm like, this is even worse. At least I'm asking. But motherhood shifts you. Motherhood gives you different perspectives. Your priorities change. I had a certain respect for my mother that I had never had before. For any mother here, the lengths to which you go, the emotions that you battle with, those of anger, sometimes frustration, and sometimes even questioning why this child is crying or why this child is hungry. We all experience that. We moved to South Africa. And now I thought this is now going to be the big reset. So now you arrive with two children, a house help and a husband, and figuring out all those things, they may sound very easy now, but it's really tough. When you see people moving, it looks glorious, but the process of transition into your new life or building a new life is exceptionally hard. Move to the work environment, different cultures. Our cultures may be different, but in many ways similar. In the time that I was working in South Africa, they were still going through the integration um, across races. And I remember my first management meeting where as we took the roll call of attendance, part of the attendance was, are you black, white, or other? This took me back because I said, this cannot be happening in an office setting. But the reality is, this is what they have to do to get to where they need to, to become integrated. There's also something that we can learn from that. Many times, and now that I'm semi in the public sector, it is important for us to also consider tribal balance. So, same, same, but different. That was another shift. In uh, 2019, this is a shift that I chose. I think I did. I decided to try out my hand in, in the Juakali sector as a consultant, like most Kenyans. And Esther had, uh, actually before that, Esther had uh, landed a role uh, in Zambia. So she was also planning now to move, you know, physically to Zambia. We had decided because of the kids, we don't want to move them. I will stay back with them. They're in boarding school. Uh, but me working for myself will give me a bit more flexibility to be able to, to be there for them. This is 2019. What happens in 2020? COVID. During that time, I could also say that one of the things that also shifted was our relationship. It's not that it had ever been bad, but now because you're literally in each other's spaces, you start to understand what people are actually doing. You're spending a lot of time together. You start to really appreciate who you have beside you to see you through all these changes. Personally, for me, it was a big change. And I had to accept a different role in the, in, the, in the family, so to speak. Esther's career is still, you know, shooting through the roof. And I, want, I now have to play a role more supportive in different, view, different ways. Because, okay, number one, my office is at home. So when there's something missing in the house, I'm probably the first guy to notice. I don't then call her and tell her, hey, Esther, where is the Weetabix? You know, get in your car and go and buy this stuff, you know, kind of thing. Kids need to be picked up from school, those, those kind of things. So you, you start getting into a different kind of partnership. But as a man also, uh, you start also to question a few things. You're now you know, properly in your middle age. Is this the right thing to do? Should I go back to employment? Am I, is this going to work? And a lot of stuff tends to happen in your mind. And you just have to convince yourself that... You've made the right decision. You've got the right partner beside you to support you through 
these different changes in your life. I want to also use this opportunity to be also grateful for the partnership that I've had. You know, when you're going through change, it is hard, it is a test, and it needs a lot of courage. My partner here has given me a lot of courage. Standing by you when you're about to die, helping you raise children, learning to work with your extended family, supporting you in your career, despite what society thinks, that is courage. And that is what is required when you're going through change. Resilience. All these moments that we speak about and joke about right now were not as easy as you think. There are moments of tears, there are moments of frustration. There are moments like, I do not want to continue. I have good friends who are also here with me. I've got my children who are my anchor. And more importantly, I've got a friend in my husband and parents who keep me anchored. The last thing from a point of shift, or a point of change, is just having faith. We didn't know when we started this journey 18 years ago that this is where it was going to end. We're not end, but this is where it was going to be. But here we are today, able to share our story with you and hoping that it can touch each one of you in different ways. And whatever you're going through, just know it will end and there will be an outcome. Then I hand over back to my darling husband. Today I've been called darling. There must be a problem. <laughs> One thing we are sure of is change. Change is always happening. Right now, we continue to change as a couple. There was a time when, you know, you just wake up on a loose Saturday morning, jump in the car, and you go to Nax Vegas. Right now, you're wondering, do I have enough money to pay for the girls' school fees? You're now being looked up to as a mentor, as an uncle, as a brother, son, to support extended family. You, you have a bigger position to play in life. This is what always happens. This shift will always be happening. How you choose to roll with those punches will really be up to you. At the end of the day, the different anchor points that Esther mentioned would be critical in ensuring that you see yourself through uh, the shift. Lastly, I would like to say that, uh, coming back to my Zach, as we call him, we have a much better relationship now. Must be having him mellowing, mellowing out with old age. He's also a little unwell, so we are, we are supporting him a lot in different things in his business, uh, at home, you know, runs to the doctor, all these kind of things. But we are all learning, we are all growing. We are learning to forgive, we are learning to shift. Thank you.